Hey, what's up, guys? Jace Two Cents here, bringing us some more Asus goodness here. You guys have complained that there's not enough, enough Asus products on the channel, and I think we've solved that here with the uh, X99 product launch. So now we're gonna dive in here with the X99 Deluxe. We're gonna talk, uh, well, pretty much all about this motherboard, and I'm not an AI or auto-tune or whatever you wanna call it, overclocker. I like to get down and dirty and play with all the specs myself. But at the end of this video, we're also gonna do some uh, auto-tuning here with the overclocking and the 5960X, and we're gonna see how well this thing can perform. So obviously we have a motherboard here, but there's some other things on the table. So yeah. take it away, JJ, and what are we looking at? So we're looking at the Deluxe. I mean, this is pretty much, you know, our uh, our highest end version of a mainstream motherboard that we're gonna offer on the X99 platform. I love the sideways battery, by the way. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, <laughs> you know, you gotta try to have a little bit of easy access, right? Because exactly. of course, if you have the GPUs Don't in have to there. Pull G and if they're water-cooled, man. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a pain, right? But I mean, historically, it shouldn't be an issue because I mean, the battery should at least be lasting you three to five years right. uh, on average. Um, but we will actually have a total of three uh, mainstream SKUs. There'll be the Deluxe, there'll be a Pro, and then there'll be a Dash A. So that follows pretty much the traditional trend of what we have on the mainstream lineup for the Z-Series chipset. Um, with the Deluxe, you're pretty much getting the absolute best of the best in terms of all the things that you would want on a really high-end board are here. So, of course, all the X99 spec is a given. So we're not right. going to cover the fact that it supports all three of the CPUs. It's DDR4. That's a given. So what really are going to be the distinguishing points? Well, first and foremost, you're going to have a ton of just PCIe expansion. As you can see, we've got one, two, three, four, five, a total of physical by 16 slots, and then we have a by four there as well. Uh, the board is really well suited for two-way and three-way GPU configurations, and that actually ties in with a really cool feature that we've introduced right here, which is a selectable switch that will illuminate LEDs that are on the board that will let you know what's the preferred layout recommendation for two-way or three-way GPUs. That, that in itself is really cool, um, because the, every motherboard layout is different, and when it comes to trying to figure out what's the optimized you know, two-way or three-way configuration, with this many PCI slots, you kind of, sometimes we're left going, okay, which one kind of has the same amount of gap? You know, you're just right, kind of right. guessing, but sometimes that's not the correct configuration. Right, and it depends because a lot of times, of course, lanes might be associated in one way uh, and they might be associated in another way. So you're looking for that optimal mix. So we've right. already gone ahead and laid that out for you. Now, outside of that, the board, of course, has all the storage connections that you would expect. So we've got serial ATA, we have SAT Express, and we have M.2. So when we take a look here and we just... Uh, reference some of the serial ATA. We've got two, four, six, eight, 10, 12. So 12 total SATA 6G ports on the board. That's just a monster amount right. of connection. But of course, if we take a look right there, uh, we've got, of course, SATA Express. So each SATA Express port uh, will, of course, work independently as two SATA 6G ports. So you're good to go. And right here, we've got the M.2. So all the way around, pretty much any storage device that's currently on the market, you're going to be able to go ahead and interface with this board and be able to take advantage of Which it. Which is already like kind of one of the blaring improvements of the X99 platform over, over X79. For sure. Uh, in addition to that, though, the Deluxe also does come included with this guy right here, which is the Hyper M2 by 4 uh, M.2 expansion card. So if you don't want to use that, maybe you just want to simply go ahead and put it on here, you can go ahead and do that. If you want to be really crazy, you could buy two M.2 SSDs and you could do a software RAID and have mm -hmm. some really crazy throughput because you're only limited by the PCI Express throughput. Right. Uh, a lot of users don't realize that when they try to do these crazy big RAID arrays on the local chipset, the local chipset actually is what's called DMI Bandwidth Limited. Uh, it really only can do about 1.6 gigabytes of right. total throughput. So once you get to about like a third or fourth SSD, it pretty much scales off. It doesn't scale anymore because there's not enough throughput as, on as the much connection as to the I, PCI Express. As much as I hate to use the term bottleneck, it's truly a bottleneck. Yeah. Um, so uh, th that is just kind of a reality of the way the storage array configuration works. So this is a, another option outside, of course, RAID controllers or PCI Express-based solutions. Now, the Deluxe also still features a fully isolated audio design. There's an integrated audio amplifier on here, and we also have our uh, Nichicon audio capacitors. Uh, one of the really cool things that we've also gone ahead incorporated here is we have a depop filter. So that means that when you restart your system, you don't get this pop that would come out yeah. of your system, which is a nice uh, kind of subtle And that's subtle really touch. annoying when you have a subwoofer. Yeah, for sure, <laughs> like exactly. Boom, boom. Yeah, you hear, this, you hear that big old pop. Of course, you've got the front headphone here and then you have the line level outputs. Okay. Uh, so that's entirely available to you. And that detection technology that we have that's built in to allow you to go ahead and map to that can work for both the front headphone as well as the line out. And we can auto switch in and out between those two. Nice. 
Yes, okay. um, we also, of course, maintain DTS Connect for guys that want to sometimes uh, take their audio and multi-channel audio output it through a digital connection to like a sound bar, like a receiver or something like that. Especially for uh, high entertainment uh, PCs for the, like, the living room area, you right. get a lot of people that want to be able to have that. And speaking here on the back I.O., you can see that the board is pretty well stacked, right? So you've got yeah. two Intel Gigabit Ethernet ports that are built onto the board. We've got two, four, six, eight, ten. 10 USB 3 ports. Uh, they also feature our USB 3 boost technology, so that allows you to quick charge smartphones and tablets even if the system's off. You got USB 3 boost, which is a way to optimize storage devices mm -hmm. and give them either better performance. Uh, you got classic two USB 2 ports on there for legacy interoperability and compatibility. So for like some keyboards, some mice, some devices, right. sometimes they may not always 100% be. I know some um, people have wondered, well, if, if USB 3.0 is backwards compatible, why do you even have 2.0? But there are some really old legacy devices that may not actually work on a 3.0. Yeah. You also, on this board you have the world's first motherboard that has full 802.11 AC 3x3. This is pretty monstrous that you can have real world throughput that's going to be in the vicinity of, you know, three to four and a half times the speed of 10100 Ethernet. It's right. pretty nuts. Um, and along with that, it fully supports uh, what's called beamforming and TurboQuam, and you get Bluetooth. So pretty awesome. So when you take a look at that all the way around, you're pretty much packed to the gills. And in terms of also the networking, we have what's called our Turbo LAN uh, packet priority software. The big difference as opposed to something like the killer solution is that our packet priority software can work on any one of the network ports as well as the wireless and on any add-in device that you were ever to put on this board. Right. So it's not limited to a specific connection. Whereas in killer, if you were using, let's say, Wi-Fi, you can't prioritize your packet priority for whether it's gaming, for downloading, browsing, or whatever it might be. So you've got a lot more flexibility in this type of solution. Now, in terms of the rest of the board, uh, the board is packed in terms of fan connectivity. We've got six onboard fan headers. They're all four pin, but they all fully support DC and PWM output control. Um, and that brings us to this little guy right here, right. which I know we which talked about. We, you were, we you talked about it off camera, and this is really awesome because you guys know my systems tend to run an awful lot of fans because I'm a diehard water cooler. Yep. I mean, the f system behind me right here has 18 fans. Or, I'm sorry, not 18 because I couldn't go push pull, but we're still north of, of 13, 14 fans. Um, so, which leads to the question of, how do you control all those fans if right. you're like me and you don't want to go with a dedicated fan controller? Yep. So explain this. So the great thing is one, is that having true PWM output control, not just on the CPU, but on every single fan header, means that we could just go ahead and buy like a cheap PWM fan splitter cable, you know, four or five bucks, goes one, goes into the fan header, and then you could have three or four outputs. And then on those three or four outputs, you connect the fans and just power those by the power supply. Right. But all those can still be controlled within the actual UEFI or within the operating system. Um, so that's a great degree of flexibility. But this little fan extension module, though we natively take the, the six fan headers and give you nine fan headers. Right. Um, the cool thing is this is entirely transparent. The moment you plug this in, it looks like they're just another set of fan headers on the motherboard. So you have nine fan right. headers. So it does it like on some fan control Controllers may only see it as one fan, but it's just yeah. kind of dummy splitting off to other fans. The motherboard will see each fan connected to this independently. Correct. So you have true nine actual individual fan headers right. that all have DC, PWM, and even fan calibration. So we offer the ability that we can automatically calibrate all your fans. That's still available to you on this. On top of that, one of the really awesome things as well is we have full temperature input mapping to all those fan headers. That's something that most users don't even realize they have the ability because they might right. not realize the level of fan control that we're offering. But what that means is that uh, the chassis fan header can respond to any one of these three temperature inputs, another optional temperature input that's on the motherboard, as well as outside of the CPU, the VRM, the PCH, or the motherboard temperature. Right. So you can have your fans literally respond to your system in the most specific conditional ways. And that's awesome, because I, I don't, I'm not a fan of fan controllers, because I just don't want to add another level of a device to fail. Yeah. And, and the motherboard seems like the most logical place to let the control happen anyway. Yeah. Um, okay, so obviously we do have a Thunderbolt device here, which is pretty self-explanatory. It's not really new to this platform. Correct. But it's just, uh, but you won't probably see it on most X99 platforms, so it actually is pretty special. But mm -hmm. we offer Thunderbolt EX support on all our X99 boards, including the Deluxe. So you can go ahead and just easily add that in there right. and you're good to go. In the same way that uh, we are also still offering NFC Express support on this board, uh, where cool. you can just go ahead and connect it and you have a whole bunch of awesome functions that you can do with NFC device, right. devices. Right, so you can transfer a device from mobile device. Or transfer files from mobile devices and stuff. You can by transfer, just having turn it near on the computer. system, log in, all kinds of really, awesome. really, really cool stuff uh, that's built into that. So the last, probably really special part to the Deluxe is really our AI Suite 3 platform. Uh, and, this and, and we do have this right now running in the system behind JJ. This is a 5960X yeah. with the uh, X99 Deluxe. 
Um, and so what we're going to go ahead and do there is we're, we're actually going to go through the process of actually showing you guys quickly uh, what a little bit of the interface looks like, what are some of the new functions, and then what an auto-tuned environment looks like. But the great thing we really that we have with the AI Suite 3 is it's a full system utility. We can do monitoring, we can do tweaking, we can do tuning, mm -hmm. we can do fan calibration, and we can do auto-overclocking. And the auto-overclocking is really the unique part. So uh, with that, let's and, go ahead. And I'm and most interested in that because like I've said, I've, I've been very vocal against AI tuning, not yeah. just ACES, but anybody's, no, because no, I'm, and, I'm all about learn the yeah. features. Um, which, but AI tuning, and, and Paul made a very good point. Um, yeah, Paul's hardware is here. Hi, Paul. Hi. Uh, he made a very good point, too, that AI tuning, in the very least, gives you a very good baseline to start at for your manual overclocking yeah. as well. And actually, I would say that it, it actually does what you're going to even do manually. Um, there's almost and that, that's a bold statement, so yeah. let's see how it does. Um, yes, I definitely think that's okay, <laughs> but, um, but you make a very good point is that regardless, it's also one of the best ways that you can take literally the uh, thousands of man hours that we've had and cumulatively in a very short period of time be able to have a baseline and understanding of what your system, specific to your CPU, your memory, your cooling, your power supply, can produce as far as a result. And then if you want to take it further, you can definitely do that. So let's I think do it. let's take a closer look at it. Transition. So as we see right here, we've got a couple of options. We've got all core overclocking, but I prefer to go with our default, which is per core, just means that we're gonna dynamically tune mm -hmm. each individual core so that we get the best maximum performance uh, versus fixing the processor to run at the same frequency across right. the board. Because um, then you can only overclock as far as the worst core. Correct, yes, as opposed to maximizing better cores. Um, directly below that, we have different tuning parameters. So you can start from what's referred to as our optimal ratio, just means it'll start auto overclocking from kind of predetermined value that we've seen from the majority of CPUs. If you want to be the absolute safest though, you can go from the pure default, so tuning from the absolute pure stock. So continuing on from where we have the actual default ratio, you can also manually assign it. So if you want to kind of shoot for a specific target, then you can go ahead and define that target and will attempt to automatically tune to that designated target frequency. Now, uh, a new option that we've also introduced is going to be this one right here, which is going to be OC tolerance, which essentially just gives us the granularity of ensuring that we tune for the maximum potential on higher cores a higher frequency capable cores versus limiting the total overclock once again uh, to all cores. Mm. So this will allow us to maybe say in a situ certain situation, you could have uh, four cores operate at 4.6, but then the rest of the cores would only be able to operate 4.3. We can maintain that type of overclock scenario. And then directly below that, other new additions is we have voltage tuning. So by default, we have a built-in hard rule that will limit it to 1.3 volts. But for this generation, users can go ahead and exceed that if they have the cooling capability right. to handle greater than 1.3 volts. But that's gonna probably be, for the majority of users, where you really want it to sit, and that's what the default is. But you can go in there, you could see, we could go in and we could define that, and you could just simply, you know, set that to whatever you feel comfortable with. Right, especially if you're on a, you know, custom water cooling loop or something like that, you can go in there and just say, I'm comfortable with 1.35. Yeah, exactly, and you could maybe potentially get even a little bit higher result, right? Uh, directly below that, once again, you've got the tuning frequency option that's available to you right here, and then we also even have temperature-based targeting, which is really cool. If you're somebody that just- It's kind of like GPU boost for your CPU. Yeah, if you just want to say, hey, I I want you to get me to whatever I can, but always, I still want to operate less than ADC, then just go ahead and target that and, and you're good to go. That's perfect for people that live in a hot climate. Yeah. Where they could say, okay, I'm comfortable with you know, 80, 85, give themselves enough thermal headroom from TJ Maxx, and then just let the rest work itself out. Yeah. And then we've also incorporated a full uh, multi-threaded memory stress testing. The reason why that's important is because sometimes you can have a purely stable CPU frequency, right. um, but the memory divider at that frequency may not be stable. Right. So actually tuning both of these at the same time sometimes brings down the total value, but actually ensures much, much better stability. Correct. And then speaking of stability, this is a really big one. We've now included AVX instruction set support. So for users that are maybe content creation guys, but also yeah. gamers or general productivity, this is the same like running like Handbrake or RipBot or Adobe Premiere. And that's huge for a guy like me because there's plenty of times the synthetic benchmarks won't hit these types of instruction sets so that yeah. I think I have a really strong overclock or really stable overclock in 8064 or Prime 95 and I get into Vegas or I get into Premiere and I start crashing. Yeah. So this is, this is huge. So I'm just gonna pretty much leave it at its default values. I'm not gonna um, pretty much modify anything. Um, right, out, like, out of the box type of config. Yeah, yeah and uh, we'll go ahead and do it. The CPU I have in here is actually really not that great of a CPU, um, but we're gonna go ahead and run it, and then we'll come back to see its results. Now, all I'm doing is I'm unchecking the other portions of the five optimization, right. um, just because we're just targeting showing you this guy as an example. So yeah, And I think, I'm, I think we mentioned at the beginning of the video, in case we didn't, this is the 5960X, the eight core 16 thread CPU, which he says is not a great overclocker, 
Um, so let's let's go ahead and show the audience here what a not great overclocker actually does. Sure. Let's <laughs> let's go ahead and uh, we'll start it off and we'll see what the results look like. I, I'm excited. So at that point, it's going to go ahead and just start the tuning process, and we'll come back to it in a little bit, and we'll see what it shows. Okay. Uh, okay. So obviously, this thing failed, and it found its uh, its its stable overclock. Correct. So it rolled it back slightly too, because I believe it failed at what 4.6 attempt. I believe so. Yes. Correct. Right. So 36% overclock, 4.5 gigahertz on a 3 gigahertz base clock on the 8 core 16 threads. Right. 16 threads of 4.5 gigahertz. And this is a poor overclocker in your experience? Uh, yes, yes. Well, when we consider also that if we would have incorporated the AVX, which would have been a heavier load, it would have been lower. Um, right. So overall, I consider it a little bit of a poor overclock. But I think the thing that it overall highlights is that you know we've, uh, we've done a huge amount of work that manually, even if you're a manual tuner, mm. to do this same thing would have literally cost you and if you were skilled, it would cost you at least probably two and a half to four and a half hours. And you would have to have information immediately available to you on how to tune the platform, as opposed to somebody that might not know anything where it could take you literally uh, tens of hours and maybe even a couple of days. What I love is that it shows individual clock speed on there. We have some cores at 4.5 and some at 4.4? Correct. So as you can see, what we've done is we've tuned cores from one to four up to 45, and then for the remainder of all core frequency, when it's under all load, it's gonna be at 44. Right, and maximum temperature was 69 degrees Celsius and, uh, for that, as you were mentioning, you know, the multiple uh, temp probe locations. Yeah. That's a kind, of a, kind of like a package temp, in a sense. Correct, but you can also monitor, if, so if you go back and look in the reporting tool, or if you were looking at it, it was actively looking, we do also report the pure DTS temperature. Mm -hmm. So you get both temperatures that are reported to you. The other thing I think is, the other thing I really like about this is it does show you the, the wattage draw. Yep. But it doesn't, for most people overclocking, they really don't care about that. They have PSUs that can handle it. They have coolers that can handle it. Uh, but it, it shows you realistically how much power you're really drawing. So from 140 watt base TPU up to uh, 132.3 is what it's showing. That's yeah, the, yeah, the TDP jumped quite TDP, a bit. I said TPU. Um, Thermal protection unit? I don't know what's TDP. <laughs> well, TDP. Well, the, the, main, the main thing is, like you said, is a lot of people don't conscientiously keep in mind how much power draw may change, um, but we think it's an important metric um, yeah. because sometimes people don't maybe always have the best power supplies, and this helps you to understand how much maybe you're looking at total power consumption. But all the way around, the great thing is that it's a simple solution to be able to give you an overclock so that if you put together a really cool build, You've got great quality hardware. It's an easy way to effectively actually leverage it. Okay, so we're talking 4.5 gigahertz overclock through auto tuning. That's 1.5 gigahertz overclock in auto tuning. So let's say 1.3 if we want to be conservative and know that with ABX enabled, we might have crashed slightly sooner than that. Correct. Um, so even assuming it would have crashed sooner, let's say 1300 megahertz of extra power through clicking a button, letting it go, took what, five minutes, if that, maybe, uh, maybe to 10. Total time I would say is generally gonna be between about nine to 12 minutes for the auto tuning process. Do you know how much time a, a manual, uh, yes, you do know, but yeah. do you guys know how much time a manual overclock of testing individual perimeters could take to get to this? Um, now, but what did it do with memory in terms of XMP profile? So what did it so, actually so do? So that's a great question. We don't leave memory by itself, but memory is a little bit variable. The memory controller that's built into the CPU, um, even when you buy XMP memory that's validated at that speed, the memory controller may not always be able to run at that right. speed. Um, so what we do is we automatically enable an XMP profile up to 2400 speeds. If it's greater than that, that memory speed won't be leveraged or won't be utilized. Right. Um, you would have to manually, manually enable it. And that's a really good point. I think a lot of people fail to realize that XMP profile is an overclock of the memory Correct. itself. Yes. It's, it's the base clock of the memory here is 2133, yeah. but the XMP is actually an overclock profile for the memory, so it's not guaranteed speeds. Well, the memory is guaranteed to run at that speed. But not but necessarily the, with your CPU's correct. overclock. When the memory vendor qualifies the memory, they're doing it with a CPU that at, actually operates at that speed. Right, an advertised spec, uh, speed of 3.0 to 3.3. So, so you always kind of look at it from the condition, if your CPU can run at that right. speed, this memory can run at that speed. Right. Yeah. With, with out of the box specifications. Correct. So from our perspective, we tried to target an XMP value that we feel almost all CPUs, even under an overclock configuration, will be able to leverage. But you can also further test all of this by enabling those options that we discussed. Well, guys, I hope you've enjoyed our, uh, our review here of the X99 Deluxe here from ASUS. Uh, Dual Intelligent Processors 5, five-way optimization. I, I actually recommend this software. It's very rare that I recommend a piece of software to do what I love to do as an enthusiast manually. Um, I think it's gonna be a great solution for a lot of people out there who just kinda wanna set it and forget it. 
And uh, JJ, once again, thanks for coming by. Thank you for Shake having me. Shake your hand for about the 18th time today because, well, it's JJ after all. You guys, you guys know JJ. You have to love JJ. All right, we're going to get the heck on out of here. Once again, check out PCDIY on YouTube. Uh, follow on Twitter. Does PCDIY? It doesn't have a Twitter, does it? Google it's, Plus. Google Plus. All right, guys, we'll get the heck on out of here. We'll see you in the next one. <laughs>